How's that for a first glitch? Hey, thanks for uh, joining me, everybody. Yes, I am learning some new software. And so, yes, that was the first flub. Let's see if there's a second. What I need to know is if you guys can actually hear me because the downfall to this software is that I have no idea the audio levels. Now, I know what's here in my studio here on my uh, mixer behind me, but I need to know if it's actually working. Now, this should be for the first time broadcasting to every social media that I have with the exception of the Black Vault Facebook group, simply because there's some error with Facebook. I did a test yesterday, worked fine. Of course, uh, you know, we, we do it live and for real and it doesn't work. So it, this may ultimately be a disaster. Um, so you guys are saying, So you guys are saying I'm low, and I totally buy it. Um, so this is what's confusing to me is that I'm I'm seeing all sorts of comments. Some are some are that I'm too low. Others are saying that it's just fine. So audio on YouTube is working fine. A bit low, better now, perfect. Uh, tell you what, I'll go ahead and ad adjust it uh, just a little bit. So you guys tell me if that's any better compared to the music. I'll find out after. It it works in my ear, so that's um, another, we'll just add that to the blunder list. Who knows, maybe I'll just go ahead and delete this video after uh, as I learn here. But uh, I know why you guys are here with the post that I did. So I'm hoping that, yeah, it looks like, okay. So a lot of people are saying good now, perfect. All right, and still complaints. So I'm gonna go, go ahead and, and do this the way that it is, uh, we'll go ahead and, and see. Okay, yeah, still mixed reviews. I'm wondering if YouTube and Facebook broadcast a little bit differently with audio. So we'll, we'll find that out. But here's what I want to do with this particular broadcast. And that is update you guys on a post that you probably saw, or at least some of you saw. It got a lot of play, uh, meaning a lot of interaction, a lot of uh, engagement where I announced on Saturday, the Friday, uh, the UAP report was released. That Saturday morning, I had filed what's called a mandatory declassification review request. And now let me go ahead and pull up, I'm sure I'll screw this up too somehow. Uh, this is the Twitter post that was done about this. Uh, this was uh, made under the uh, the Federal Register Chapter 32, Section 1704. In essence, what that means in plain English is this here, uh, the Code of Federal Regulations, I should say, the Mandatory Declassification Review Program for the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. I'm starting there with that kind of mouthful because this was one of the biggest questions that I got. And the biggest question that I got was, well, w why are you doing it uh, under that, what is that? Is that a FOIA request? Is it the same as FOIA? So I'm gonna start here. No, it is not the same as FOIA. FOIA is United States Code Chapter 5, Section 552, for those who love to take notes. In essence, that is what outlines the federal program to allow you and me and anyone on the planet, by the way, you don't have to be an American citizen, to access information through FOIA. Now that's Chapter 5. Section 552, as I said, there is a different uh, program, so to speak. It's not technically a program, but there's a different method that you can use to access information. And instead of going through FOIA, you file what's called an MDR. Now, the MDR is a little bit different. It's not as commonly used. And there, I would say, arguably, it's not as widely known. There's a big gray area on the difference between what the FOIA and MDR will accomplish. I can tell you I'm no attorney, but I can also tell you that every agency is different and every agency handles FOIA and MDR slightly different. In fact, the federal regulations differ for the different agencies. Now, what does that mean? Well, that there's no one going formula on how all of this is processed, which makes all of this even more confusing. So I'm gonna tell you what my non-legal jargon definition is based on experience. So let me give you an example. Let's say that somebody did a Freedom of Information Act request in the year 2000, right? So that's 21 years ago, I can't even believe that. 
But 21 years ago, in the year 2000, someone does a FOIA request for a document. That document is 50% redacted, and it is sent out. If I request that in July of 2021, some agencies, there are exceptions to the rule, but most agencies will take that document the way that it was released in the year 2000, and they will send it to me and say, here you go, and that's a, considered a grant, uh, meaning they granted my request, partial grant, but grant nonetheless. They close the case and that's it. They don't re-review what was classified in, 2000, in the year 2000 versus what could be released in 2021. So that's if I file a FOIA under Chapter 5, Section 552 of the U.S. Code. Now, what if I file an MDR? And this is where the name and the process takes over and it lives up, uh, lives up to its name. The mandatory declassification review request. If I file that for that document that was released 21 years ago, then what they have to do is a mandatory review to see if that material can then come out and be released. And if it can be, then they will take some of that redaction off and hopefully release it in full, but that rarely happens, but, but it has, I've, I've had those successes, uh, but those are rare. Generally, you'll still have some redactions, but they will still go out and they will fulfill the request. That's the difference. So for years and years and years under FOIA, they'll, they'll send out that same document. And for those who pay attention to this channel and the Black Vault, you'll know that I have gone back to numerous different topics and tried to essentially get older documents that have been released before re-reviewed. In some cases, there's been success, successes. In some cases, there's been failures. In other cases, it, it gives you a new development where they've mysteriously lost the material. A very quick story uh, th that uh, deals with the topic at hand uh, with UFOs is the National Security Agency. National Security Agency claims they lost nearly 100% of the hundreds of pages that I and a select few others fought for about 20 years ago, a little over 20 years ago. We finally got them, but they were heavily redacted. Uh, quite a few years ago, I requested an MDR review of all of them, and all of them were lost, with the exception of one, which was a court document. That's another video in itself. But that is the MDR process. So back to the UAP report. So that Friday, the unclassified version comes out. Saturday morning, I immediately file for the classified version. This is the second point that I want to address because I know that this was commonly thrown my way. Good luck. It's classified. You'll never get it. And even though I love hearing those comments, because they may be right. I, I could absolutely fail in getting a single character released. I, it, this is not a guarantee. It is a mandatory review, but it, there's no guarantee. So I decided, contrary to my general norm, to announce the process and to keep you guys updated. And with this video, kind of tell you a little bit more about how that process works and, and what it's all about. But I want you to see either how it works, but I also want you to be let down with me. And I've had many, many letdowns over the years. So this can go, this can go either way. You know, we have no idea where this is going to go, but I'm hopeful and I'm, and I'm, and I'm, and I'm going to explain why I'm hopeful, but I at least wanted to set up why I'm telling you guys this because it's not my norm. I generally do not update uh, really anybody on what I'm going after until it's done because I don't like hype. I don't like misleading. I don't like to give the impression that I'm going to be able to achieve something when I don't know. So I'll say it a million times. I don't know if this MDR is going to be successful, but I believe it will partially be. And here's why. So that was Saturday morning. I filed the case. Sunday morning, to the credit of the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, I was in communication with them early Sunday morning, trying to get any details whatsoever about the classified version. Of course, they're not gonna give it to me just by asking, but what I wanted to find out was how many pages it was. There's rumors. There's rumors it's over 70 pages long. Now we know that the unclassified version was nine pages, right? It was pretty much a letdown. 
Uh, but the classified version has been said by a couple people. Luis Elizondo, the most noted, I believe you said that on my friend Jimmy Church's, that uh, it was oh, 78 pages, I think he said. And so if that's, if that's the case, then there's a lot more information to be found. I am going to make a prediction, but this is not based on anything other than just a gut feeling. It won't be that big. Now, I do believe Mr. Elizondo has connections. I'm not saying he's wrong, but if I were to bet a nickel, I would say it's going to be under 20. I uh, will see, uh, but I do not believe that they would have a nine page public and a 78 or whatever it was page classified. But what I did on that Sunday morning was try to get just a page count. They would not give it to me. Uh, the statements that they gave me essentially was that there was a, a report delivered, a classified, they call it a classified annex or classified version, classified report, all the same thing. It was really never, from what I understand, confirmed until Sunday morning that there was actually a classified version. The assumption was there, but again, trust me, you can get very tripped up by assuming things. So they did confirm that. They said the classified report, this is a quote from them, the classified report includes some additional information that could not be declassified consistent with the protection of sources and methods. So what they're saying with this is the only reason, according to this statement, that the classified version is classified is that there's sources and methods. The definition of sources and methods is essentially how they obtain the information, whether that be human or human intelligence, a, you know, confidential informant of some kind, comment or communication intelligence, intercepted communications, whatever the sources and methods are, that is an exempted and generally a classified category of material. It's also really easy for them to hide behind. So <laughs> it's Friday night. I'm going to put this on screen just because I can. Mike Rotunda, drink every time he says classified. I'll drink to that. This is water, I swear. But you guys play along. Uh, that sounds like a fun game for a Friday night. So the other only other detail that I could get out of them uh, about the classified version is uh, other than the sources and methods, because, again, that that that's very easy for them to hide behind. And it's very hard for me to prove that that's why they're keeping it classified. So that's the only reason they give. They said this, the unclassified preliminary assessment and classified annex are substantively consistent and the key conclusions are the same in both. In essence, they're the same. There's no hidden magician trick here where they tell the public one thing and the left hand secretly is, is, is saying another, you know, in, in closed doors and skiff somewhere. There was, there was obviously a clear intent here to say both reports conclude the same. This is why I feel that there will be portions of the classified version released. Keep in mind a lot of stuff that's classified, at least in my experience over the years with, with what I have foia inside the UFO arena and beyond, a lot of stuff that's classified generally doesn't remain classified, meaning it has a classification on it, but sometimes that's not warranted. So a review like an MDR request takes that classification away. I'll give you a prime example. The FLIR, the Gimbal, and the GoFast were temporarily classified secret, but they were actually never classified videos. In essence, security classifications can be put on and taken off at will. So if there's a determination that something may be classified, right? Somebody thinks that it can be classified. In the case, the Gimbal, FLIR, and GoFast videos, when they were being reviewed before the general public ever saw them, they can just go and say they're classified secret. We'll go ahead and, and, and keep them as such. Now, they eventually took it off because they realized that they were unclassified. They were always unclassified. And so, therefore, they had approved an internal use of the videos. That is how classification works. So, sometimes something can be classified secret, but you file a case and it's immediately declassified because there's no justification to keep it classified. Going back to the sources and methods comment, if they truly believe that it's just sources and methods, 
I do not believe that that would be the majority of the report. It will be a certain percentage of the report, but if the conclusions are the same, that percentage, I believe, will be released. What I'm looking for to achieve with this is how big it was, because if they deny it in full, that'll tell me that answer. You know, they'll generally say we found 39 pages, 100 pages, 12,000 pages, but they're all classified, and they'll give you an answer, or they will release it, redacted, of course. I expect those redactions. But I think that, that at this point, chances are good. They have communicated with me. That was Sunday morning. I got those quotes. There was nothing else that I can get other than confirmation that one thing in their report uh, so this is just an extra tidbit of, of information. On page one, the report stipulated it was prepared for the Congressional Intelligence and Armed Services Committee by the UAP Task Force, which is located at the U.S. Navy's Office of Naval Intelligence and the Office of Director of National Intelligence's National Intelligence Manager for Aviation. That was new. I had not heard that, that title before or who that was or them being connected to the UAPTF effort. So even though I didn't get any statement on this whatsoever, I did some digging around, found out that the person who holds that position was most likely Major General Daniel L. Simpson from the United States Air Force. And that was surprising to me because that is the one agency or military branch that has been completely mum about this entire topic. So I confirmed with ODNI, hey, is this that person? And they confirmed that Major General Daniel L. Simpson was the guy that also prepared that report. And you better believe that that sparked some FOIA requests, but I'm sure that'll be a video for another day. So the, the fact that the Air Force itself was connected to the UAP report was also incredibly intriguing because as most of you have probably noted, they're just nowhere to be found with, with this topic. And I've dug around and it seems like they just don't care about it. Uh, the spokesperson was saying they were talking about drones. I found those and got those uh, emails uh, out from, from a FOIA request that, that, that essentially Air Force and Navy were talking about drones and the media was the one that blew this into something that it wasn't. So be that as it may, one of the Air Force major generals is actually the one that helped prepare the report uh, with the UAPTF. So. Uh, I felt that uh, was was pretty darn interesting that that he played a role. So they confirmed that, but there was no additional statement, explanation, or anything like that. So that that gives you a little bit of a summary of the process, the difference between MDR and FOIA, and obviously my effort to get this released. On Monday, uh, the update was the case was in the system, registered with a case number, and already being processed. Mid, uh, let me see, mid this week, I think it was, let me go back, I think I had posted this, but it was mid this week, July 7th, so two days ago, I just wanna make sure I was right on the date timestamps. I had posted this out. I did have confirmation that the report was in hand. Uh, I also had confirmation that it was already being reviewed. I also had confirmation of a very rough time frame. Now, I believe, and I'm hopeful that this may be within the next five to six weeks, I hope. Now, don't lynch me if I'm wrong because anything can happen. But the process now for those uh, who are interested, because I've been, this is the last thing I wanna deal with, and I'm gonna open up the lines and see what happens because I don't know if that techno uh, te technology will work and you guys will be able to hear. But uh, the last thing that I will uh, point out is the process now, what happens is, is on that page one of the report, there were like 14 different agencies that were consulted with in this preliminary analysis of UAPs or that nine page report. We can assume that the classified version had all of those and potentially maybe even others. We'll see. Uh, I'm sniffing around on that one as well. So at least 14 plus that we know of. That means that there are 14 original classifying authorities on the information within this classified report. Because if they all contributed things that could be potentially sources and methods or some other type of information, let's use the Navy as an example. 
the Navy is the OCA on whatever that type of information is, they have to review it. The NSA is the OCA of information over here, then they have to re review that. Sounds like a very complicated process, but that process from what I understand is already underway. So those agencies are already looking over their parts of the information and will hopefully get back to ODNI to then fulfill my request. Where that goes from there, I don't know. So the reason why uh, I wanted to bring that up is this was also a question that I got a lot from those FOIA requesters that are just starting to dabble in FOIA or maybe those that have filed quite a bit but have never seen this before. And I was given the same template letter that I've been given now on a couple of requests and I know quite a few people have gotten. And ODNI is taking their request and forwarding it somewhere else whether that be the Navy, whether that be the NSA, whether that be the Air Force, wherever it may be. And that is perfectly normal. There were quite a few tweet threads about that specific topic on whether or not ODNI was passing the buck or essentially just trying to say, hey, just don't bug us. No, that is all a normal part of this process because again, the OCA or the Original Classifying Authority has to be the one that oversees that material. And then once they oversee it, they will send it back to ODNI and say, we have no objection, or this has to remain top secret for whatever reason. And, and it kind of goes from there. And then that defines the redactions. And then ODNI collects all that feedback. They put the redactions on where they don't have to, they don't. And John Greenwald's a happy dude. And I send it out to you guys for review. Hopefully that's how it comes out. Uh, but who knows, you know, again, uh, what ultimately this is this is going to be. Now, here is potentially the last blunder of this show. Let me put this on. This is my toll free call in line. Yes, you will go right on the air. I ask that you please keep it clean. Uh, you can ask whatever you'd like. You can make a comment. Uh, this is also to help me test on whether or not this is going to work and whether or not all of you can hear the caller. If not, the live stream is probably going to end pretty quick. Uh, so whomever wants to call me, see if I even have it online. Oops. Uh, yeah, I should have it on. So we'll see the brave soul who calls first, uh, if anybody. And if you do have an issue calling in, please just go ahead and post it. I should see it on the comments. Uh, I do see a call on the text line. Don't call that one. I can't patch you in. So that I'll have to hang up. So remember, call in on that toll-free line, 866-856-9722. I'll bring up my texting program here. I think I actually, sorry if I did pick that up on you, but I had to hang up on you. So I'll go ahead and leave that open, but preferably if you can. Oh no, I missed you. All right, we're gonna see if this works. You're you're live on the air. Who's this? Uh, hi, John. I'm actually watching you on the live stream right now. Well, Just figured I'd help you out. I appreciate that. Thank you. Who? Um, if anybody listening can hear the caller, please let me know in the chat room. Please let me know about volume. In my ear, he sounds perfect, but I want to make sure it's transmitting. So, what's your name? Uh, nice to meet you. My name is Madhav. Uh, I think we've interacted a little bit over Twitter before. Oh, well, I, but... I appreciate that. Thanks for helping me out. It's nice to uh, put, a, put, put a voice to your name on a Twitter handle. Yeah, thank you. And uh, good luck, man. I appreciate everything you're doing. I think it's amazing. And I'm just excited that I get to watch you and be part of it in some small way. Well, I appreciate that. Um, everybody in the chat room that I can see here and on, actually on through YouTube and Facebook can hear you. So if you have any question whatsoever or want to expand on a comment, by all means, the floor is yours. Uh, I don't have any questions, but I just want to, you know, give you my support once again. And I can't wait to see what comes of all the FOIA requests that you've put in. Awesome. Well, I really, really do appreciate that. And I'm looking forward to it as well. So thanks. Uh, thanks so much for, for calling in. Thanks a lot, Kevin. Thank you. All right. So loud, uh, loud. I see those comments. I really wish this software had some audio levels, so I'm going to have to work on that. So I apologize for the glitches. Uh, obviously, there's been a couple on this live stream. 
Uh, but it looks like, um, I mean, if these numbers, there are more than 420 of you combined. I'm sure somebody will make a joke about that. Um, yeah, well over 400 combined throughout the different channels that are watching right now. So I appreciate that. And uh, let me go ahead and uh, grab, I see another caller coming in. Hi, you're live on the air. Who's this? Hey, John, this is Stephen Miller. Hey, Stephen. Can you hear you? me? I can, yeah. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. Awesome. Man, uh, first of all, I just want to say I'm so appreciative of all the work you've done over the years, man. You've been at this for a long time, and you've done, like, the hard work that nobody else gets into, and it's super impressive. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you. Man, uh, I was wondering, this is kind of an oddball question, but uh, have you ever did any FOIAs or looked into the Cash Landrum incident? Uh, that's a great question. Um, actually, just recently, a few months ago, somebody asked me to kind of look into that a little bit more, which I have done. And I'm going to try and fix my audio here as I talk. Uh, so hopefully those in the those that are t telling me about the audio, let me know if that's any better. That should even me out with the caller. Um, anyway, Stephen, I apologize uh, for adjusting. So going back to your question, yes, uh, a couple months ago, somebody asked me to look into it. Prior to that, no, I had not. I do have some open requests to try and, you know, see what else I can uncover. I know that there's been some great researchers over the years, though, that have tackled that. So I would in no way want to take away or take credit for what they've already uncovered, because I know that there's some information there. But, uh, you know, that is something that that um, uh, that I'm, I'm kind of still pursuing. So nothing to add yet. Uh, but I do have those open cases. And, and yeah, I'm glad you brought it up, because that the, is something that the reason the reason why I ask is because I've been I've looked into UFOs my entire life and I I the more and more I look into them, you know I used to be a big believer in like Bob Lazar and and all but then you eventually you know when you when you hear enough interviews by them or you, you realize that it's it, it, there's a uh there's a finality to it. Like it's not, there's, there's not a whole lot there. I mean, when you look into you, like with him and, 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 uh, Lear and, and his buddy Gene Huff and everything. Um, but in the cash Landrum case, uh, I, I find it so interesting that they, they sued the government. They, they got cancer. The kid still tells the same story. And the thing about the helicopter, like the Chinooks, they, they said they counted a bunch of Chinooks that came in. And uh, they're, you know, the military originally came out and said if, if they would have been flying, you know, 20 something Chinooks that night, then, you know, people would know. But what I find interesting is that in Texas, right where they were, there was a base that had a bunch of Chinooks you know, there. So I, I just like, man, that's crazy. Yeah. It, it, it just, ha I mean, not a whole lot of bases in America have a fleet of Chinooks just ready to take off, you know, and, and then one, and then how would they know that, you know? So it, it so for all the, the, the cases that, that I've looked at, it, that one just stands out to me as it's not an alien, but something we made, you know, there was talk about it being a nuclear powered, uh, uh, craft that, you know, it was malfunctioning and and there's some comparisons with some of the um mccandlish drawings where you know he had like the the alien reproduction vehicle with the cameras on the outside and you know so anyway i i, I was just wondering if you had looked into that because i, I know a lot of the stuff i mean I, I think that you probably went down the same road with with kind of going dead ends i mean you know um yeah yeah so to to the information about the chinooks and stuff like that 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 is kind of along the lines of what i'm going for is verifying some of those accounts obviously the incident as a whole uh and and uh going after documents on that but again i i wish i'd have more to add to that right now uh but again that's uh, that's just something that's you know still unfolding and i'm not sure exactly when that will that will come in but i'll, I'll definitely keep you guys updated 
All right, man. Well, hey, thank you so much for taking my call. And uh, once again, I appreciate everything you do. Well, I appreciate that. And thanks for thanks for the call. So I'm, I'm working on the audio thing. I see some of your comments here. Uh, and so I'm, I'm kind of learning uh, as if you haven't been able to tell uh, the, the software that I had prior, just so you guys know, uh, I had audio levels, So I was able to adjust as I go and not having that control is killing me right now. So that's that's where I'm just kind of now that I'm actually live and broadcasting kind of seeing you know, the repercussions of it. So you keep seeing me turn around. I'm checking the audio levels on my mixer. I've never had to do that before because everything that came out of there would be adjusted by me digitally here. And I don't, I don't have that here. Uh, so that being said, you know, <laughs> we're, we're kind of, we're kind of learning as we go. So we'll see. I got another caller here. Who's this? John Greenwald, it's Luis Jimenez. How are you? Oh my gosh. The, Lu the Luis Jimenez. Like that's right. The yeah, unidentified, the host yeah. of the unidentified <laughs> celebrity review is calling me. How are you, buddy? Dude, I'm doing great. I just wanted to call you and congratulate you. Is this your first live stream? No, no. It's my first for the, with this okay. software. Right. Okay, cool. Well, man, I'm digging it. You're doing a great job. And I would say, don't worry about the mistakes. Lean into them. Yeah. Well, Lean I'm, I'm OCD, Luis, and I just need to like have everything go perfect. Absolutely perfect. I hear you, John. I hear you, John, but you're you're messing around with first world technology. It's going to fail. Yeah. Things are going to go wrong, John. I you know. Gotta, you got to just lean into them, baby, especially when it's live. Woo! Yeah. Well, Hold this is... Beat. Yeah, I, I, I've had fun with live streams on, on the YouTube channel, uh, and, and but solely on the, the YouTube channel. And I know you and I chatted about this privately, but for those tuning in, whether it be on Twitter or Facebook or whatever, uh, Luis, and I have to thank him for it, uh, really helped me because the software that I ended up getting kind of sold on because uh, for, for reasons I won't bore you with, uh, he was the one that really kind of helped me out in, in answering questions. He was like a salesperson, I felt he should have commission of some kind uh, because he helped me out. So, you know, I hope you know how much I appreciate that because obviously that's that's not what you had to spend your your time doing, but you did. So I appreciate Dude. it. But uh, Dude, man, it's my absolute pleasure. Well, and thank you. And I had the pleasure of being on your show. Uh, Unidentified Celebrity Review. Is there a quick um, web address that people can go to uh, for you? How do people just, how, how do people see nah, it? Just Google that. Just Google, Google Listen, that. Listen, this ain't about me, man. It's about you. I just wanted to congratulate no, you. I... <laughs> say, this, is, this is totally kick-ass. I love that you have a call-in number, and this is what it's about, man. People want to ask you questions. People are curious about you because you're the FOIA king. You're the guy who's actually putting in the elbow grease. So it's, uh, you know, I'm sure you got a ton of callers that are behind me, so I'm not going to waste any more time, dude. But I just want to say congratulations. I love the show. I, you're already pulling more viewers than me, so you probably made my channel obsolete. But I don't care because I love it. <laughs> I love the info, man, and I love what you're doing. Well, I appreciate that, man. Well, you take care, and thanks again. And I hope everybody does check out Unidentified Celebrity Review. Uh, as I mentioned, I was on his show, what, like a week or two ago, Luis? A lot of fun. And and I must say this. I don't know. Did I lose you? Are you still there? No, no, I'm okay. still there. So I have to tell you, you remind you reminded me of something that 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 I put myself as somebody who forgot, too is that this needs to stay fun, you know, like this yeah. needs to stay, this needs to stay something that is serious, but something that is fun that we can't get so wrapped yeah. up in our beliefs and man, being on your show and even seeing you prior. I mean, uh, you know, I don't usually just say, oh yeah, I'll be on a show without at least taking a couple moments to see what I'm getting myself into. Uh, right. and, and, uh, but I had known about your show prior with the big phone home and stuff like that. But but you reminded me, especially when I was on it, that you just need to have fun, and and so my sincere compliments uh, on that because you you can tell you guys have worked hard uh, building up your brand, but also having fun along the way. So yeah, look, you well, you have my my respect for that, and and uh, it was a lot of fun being on. Well, John, I really appreciate that, man. I mean, that's that's the whole idea is it's it's okay to take the information seriously. Just don't take yourself seriously yeah. because you're going to be wrong. <laughs> you're going to be at, yeah. at some point during this ride, you're going to be wrong. So it's okay. Just, you know, own up when you are and move, move on. Just like mistakes in a live stream, you know, embrace the mistakes and uh, learn from them and go forward. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, this has definitely been a learning experience. So, uh, so yeah, yeah. Uh, it, you know, Dude, well, you're doing amazing. It, it, it honestly it doesn't look like a first live stream. Uh, I would say maybe get some headphones, so maybe the sound is a little different, so you can hear the the stereo sound. I don't know what you're using for sound. It looks like one of those like it yeah. looks like you have a network earplug. Yeah, I've got a. <laughs> like, I use yeah, IFBs because yeah. they're a lot easier because I, I just don't like a, a headphone. But no, it, it, it yeah. tells me when I've got good volume, bad volume. So I'm just going right to have to rely on the audio meters behind me a little bit more. So I'm actually cheating and looking through the camera behind me <laughs> to see if somebody's <laughs> peeking out. But I talked to Michael no, uh, Mataluni about that. that I, was, I was very fearful about the audio. And sure enough, that uh, was the biggest blunder. So. Good, good, man. Well, I'm glad Michael helped you out, and I'm glad it, everything's going really smooth. You're doing a great job. One one other piece of advice sure. is find somebody in this chat who you can uh, rely on as far as information for your show. So, like, make them a moderator, you know, somebody you. that you can trust in this chat that you know is going to be there every show, and you can rely on them when they say, hey, your audio is great. You could go, okay, great. You know, you don't have to listen to 14,000 people because everyone's going to have a different opinion. <laughs> yeah. Ain't that true? That's the truth. There's an expression with that, but I'll try and keep it a family yeah. show. <laughs> <laughs> All right, sir. Well, enjoy. Uh, uh, good luck with the rest of the show. Thanks, and uh, and from 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 me and everyone at the show, we seriously enjoy and love what you do, and and never stop. You're awesome, man. You as well. Thanks All again. Right, you too. Peace. Luis Jimenez, awesome dude. I meant every word of that. Unidentified celebrity review. Definitely, uh, definitely check that out. So uh, let me see. I know that there's been some texts and stuff coming in, and I'm, I'm sorry that I haven't been able to, uh, to get to some of those. Here's one. I'll just go ahead and pull. Um, caller, I'm going to go ahead and put you on hold. Uh, for those who are listening and you do call in and get, get hold music, just know you're in the queue. I'll, I'll, I'll promise I'll bring you on. Uh, I want to get to some of these texts, though. My name is Dan. Uh, hi, Dan. What do you think of Stephen Greer's idea that we are being primed for a false flag invasion and Michael Sala believes it may be a false flag salvation in both cases, a bit malicious. Here's the deal with that whole thing. Uh, I don't buy the whole Stephen Greer idea with this false flag narrative. And I saw, you know, shortly before coming on today uh, where Danny Sheehan had to uh, create a statement. If you haven't seen this, maybe I should retweet it, but uh, just look for it. It's on Twitter. It's on Facebook. Daniel Sheehan, who's now the attorney for Luis Elizondo, was in the recent Stephen Greer documentary and feels I think he was misquoted. And there's that whole drama that is unfolding. Uh, it, it is so frustrating to see that because I have been very critical, actually, of everybody, but uh, but of Stephen Greer as well. I, I mean, I don't support a lot of what he has said, uh, especially with this false flag narrative. I don't believe that it's based on anything. I do believe that we hear a lot of false information from from his corner. Uh, and it's sad because back in the day, I do believe that there was a, a certain percentage of what he was doing that was very admirable, that was very helpful, that was very much achieving something in this field with bringing witnesses forward. Uh, my connection uh, to that, not, not that, um, uh, not that I played any role in that disclosure project, but what I mean is to the story was that I had been asked by then the editor of UFO magazine here in America, Bill Burns to write an article for them about the witnesses and the disclosure project. And sadly it showed me a different side of what was going on. Now, again, I don't want to take away from the valuable witnesses those that were authenticated and those that were confirmed and so on and so forth. Uh, but there were a, a small percentage of other ones that seemingly were not vetted. Uh, those that were upset that, that were being named as quote unquote witnesses and being name dropped uh, by Stephen Greer. So that's kind of drudging up stuff that was like literally what, 18 years ago, whatever it was. So, I, I mean, I'm not trying to open up that wound, but ever since then it always kind of put me essentially on guard a little bit from all the information coming from that corner. And it is, in my opinion, only gotten a little bit worse as time went on. So I don't want to talk bad about the guy. He has an open invitation to come here uh, and be on this uh, show. I, I'd be more than happy to have a conversation with him. But um, uh, 
until then, I mean, I'm, I'm going to be critical of those ideas and thoughts that should have criticism. And that is definitely one of them. Uh, caller, I know you were waiting there for a little bit, and I'm sorry. Who's this? My name's Todd. How are you, John? Hey, Todd. I'm good. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too, man. Hey, I just got two quick questions, and if you don't mind, I'll hang up and just listen to your opinion on it. No problem. In your in your experience of searching for information, when it comes to a report like this, would there be any government faction like the DOE that has different congressional oversight that would be exempt from adding data to this report that you know of? And my second question would be, um, there was a lot of hype from interviews by people like Chris Mellon and Lou Elizondo. And in this review, they looked at something with the tic, like the Tic Tac that had multiple sensors, multiple witnesses, and there still was no real conclusion drawn. I'm just wondering that where's the disconnect from um, what we're hearing. And uh, just thank you for your time, man. I appreciate it. Sure. Don't don't hang up because I want to make sure that I understand your second part, uh, the second sure. question. So the in regards to the first part that and if I understood that correctly, you're asking if there was an agency per se that would essentially be entirely exempt from FOIA and, and just kind of automatically declassified. Is that what you mean? Yes, sir, because um, Chris Mellon was on a couple of interviews where he talked about the DOE has very little congressional oversight. So I, I'm, I'm imagining this could be something like, say, hey, I'm going to allow you to look in my house, but I'm going to hide something in the garage, but you're not allowed to check the garage. So you're really going to look in the house and say, well, we found nothing, if that makes sense. Yeah, so it does. I mean, congressional oversight, I think, is a little bit different, in my opinion, than it would be on an automatic classification slash exempt category. There's really no agency that I think would just because it's from that agency would be exempt. I mean, or remain classified and automatically exempt per the law. Anyway, mm -hmm. they would all still be subject to it. They would have to claim one of the nine FOIA exemptions for that information to either be exempt or remain classified. Obviously, though, some agencies do operate with extra layers of secrecy you know, CIA, NSA, and potentially even parts of DOE would be included with that. But I think that yes, when, it, when it comes to a report like this, uh, I mean, if you're if you're honing in on the UAP classified version, I don't think that it's that high level classification by the sounds of it. Uh, I believe that that, again, by the sounds of it, this is what I'm hearing, that by the sounds of it, that if there is technical data and sources and methods, that's one thing. But it doesn't sound like they have some deep, dark, sinister cache of information that they're hiding in this report. I think that the politicians make things a little bit worse with the words that they use. <laughs> you know, I think one of them yeah. said gobsmacked or something when he read that. I, I mean, it's hard now to keep track of like all the people that said that they've seen the classified version because, you know, you have to keep in mind with with politicians. They like to be on television. They like to be quoted and they like to have those sound bites. So. You know, I always take that when a, a, a politician gets involved with a grain of salt, just simply because you don't know what their true reaction was to this. But what I'm what I'm kind of hearing through official statements, not any backdoor information, but it doesn't sound like it's that highly classified of a document that there will be classified aspects, but not classified. I only, I, I, yep, I'm sorry. I only asked be. because I, I remember hearing Donald Rumsfeld back in the day of a speech of we lost like $2 trillion that we can't account for. So that's just where I was kind of wondering if there was any way of this stuff being hidden, but it doesn't sound like it. Yeah, I don't think so. Not on this. On other material, yes, I believe. I mean, when you get into some of the surveillance programs of the NSA, I believe uh, that that is a whole different tangent that you don't want me to go down. But in short, yeah. I, I do believe that that is the, that is the, you're you're treading into some of the most classified territory in the intelligence community when you're talking about you know potentially law breaking surveillance programs on on mm -hmm. american citizens so so there's a lot of leeway there for intelligence communities to just uh, essentially glo they glomar respond to things and a glomar response is we can neither confirm nor deny so there's a lot of leeway yeah. there for the nsa's and the cia's of the ic for them to to do that 
with this report, again, not not to beat the dead horse, that's why I'm hopeful that that there is information in there that echoes the public report. But what I'm also looking for are more details. What are those cases? Yeah. Uh, you know, what, what where were where was it? Was it all off the East Coast? Was it all Navy training missions? Now, even though they don't release um, in case anybody that's listening is curious about this, let's say the long shot is they exempt everything um, and they just turn it all down. I still believe in the fit. There's 54 cases that I have filed that are connected to that report. There are a small mm-hmm. handful of those 54 that I think will get the cases that they develop uh, in, 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 in some time in sometimes a roundabout way. So I do think that that's still a possibility. But with the classified version released, that's what I'm looking for is more information and so on. Yeah. And I just don't see and them it, uh, being able it, to exempt at all. And my last question would be, if they did look at the cases, and we know the Nimitz is one of the most famous um, um, cases with how much data that we've heard Lou and Chris and the, the people involved come out with, um, there was a lot of hype about that particular case because it was one that was reviewed by the task force with all the sensors and the data that they got from that where's the disconnect of they had no conclusions when there's radar FLIR I know this is pure speculation but the people in the in the um, UFO community who have done interviews have stated that it's hard to deny, deny the spectacular events of that incident but if that was reviewed by the task force I don't see how there can be no conclusion um, done for extraterrestrial or secret tech, because other than a body or a ship, you pretty much got every piece of data you can really get in an incident. Right. Um, and, and by the sounds of it, it doesn't sound like those are what these classified or what, what the cases are in this classified report. And, and I think that there's been a lot of speculation that has leaned towards wanting to believe that that's what what's in the classified report or that's what the UAP task force is seeing, but I just don't buy it. And, and I think when it comes to the visuals and what they're seeing, I believe, and, and I could be totally wrong, but, but here's my justification for it, that a lot of the visuals that they have had, and I saw a, um, uh, a comment on this scroll by about the videos Keep in mind that from the get-go, the FLIR, the Gimbal, and GoFast were all unclassified. The mm-hmm. leaked material, with the exception of the latest video, which, which I cannot get the Pentagon to comment on, uh, all of that visual imagery was also unclassified from a classified briefing. So my question, is, and the Pentagon's like, oh, yeah, those are real. Yeah, those are, uh, they won't say they're unidentified, but they will say that they were taken by U.S. Navy pilots and so on and so forth. My whole point is, is why is there such an unclassified layer to all this UAP material? And that's what I'm most intrigued by. And that's what I think the task force is is seeing, that, that that's where, again, plays into my hope that a lot of this may come out. One other thing that I'll also um, uh, comment on is Christopher Mellon's uh, comment uh, that the U.S. Air Force has shunned the UAP task force. Now, I don't have reason to believe that's not true. So operating off the assumption it is, how much access does the UAPTF actually have? And and that is a, a question I have asked for a, a while now on what can they actually get their hands on? If Christopher Mellon is right, and I'll say it again, I don't I don't have any reason to believe that he's not, and the and the Air Force is shunning the task force and the, and they're just not helping or or whatever then how is that how is that access to trying to figure out what these cases are because again air force has classified technology they're testing all the time even though the pentagon denied to me in a statement that they would not test it on the navy without their knowledge uh, that doesn't mean that they're not testing this and it's potentially in the vicinity being captured on sensors captured on camera or whatever so my entire point with that is if the UAPTF does not have access to all of that and they cannot traverse the SAP programs, they cannot you know, tread into classified territory and classified USAF uh, tech, how good are they doing? You know, like, is this really a scientific exploration of UAPs 
Or is this a couple guys that had a congressional mandate to create a report? And they're like, ah, let's get this done. You know, I mean, that report seemed incredibly rushed to me. Page one, there was an Mm -hmm. error. They repeated one of the agencies that they consulted with. So it seemed rushed. So long winded way of saying there's there's a lot more going on here behind the scenes that we are all not privy to. And I mean, I I'm, I'm eager to, you know, find out what that is. But until then, it's it's fighting through MDR and FOIA and stuff like that. Well, thank you for doing that. And I really appreciate your time, man. Yeah, it's my pleasure. And thanks for calling. Thank you, John. Thank you. So hopefully that that made a little bit of sense. I mean, the UAPTF, the question mark is that 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 access. I mean, it really comes down to that. And with what Christopher Mellon says, and he obviously has connections, what we saw in the report, the question mark is how much involvement is the United States Air Force? How much involvement do they have and, and how much access are they giving the UAP task force? That's one of the biggest blunders about the Project Blue Book era was did they have the proper access to what they needed? to figure out, you know, what those cases were. And the argument was they didn't have the access because they only had an objective. And that objective was not a scientific exploration, but rather it was give an explanation, solve all these things. So they weren't given access to everything. They were just told, this is your mission. Go ahead and and explain everything that ties into the whole Robertson panel thing, CIA mandate. You guys got to solve this for the general public, and that's what they did. I fear that that's what we're going through again. Somebody on the phone, who's this? Um, Arthur Putnam. Well, hello, Arthur. Thanks for calling. I really appreciate it. I appreciate you taking my call. I'm looking for some advice uh, since you're kind of, uh, from what I understand, the expert on FOIA. I'm wondering, um, uh, back history here a little bit. Um, My father was an OSI agent for 20 years. Um, And I was wondering, he's no longer with us. Um, Mm -hmm. He's been gone for a while now, but um, I was born on Roswell uh, Air Force Base. And I was wondering, can I foyer his career, career records, uh, his information, we never got to find out anything he did. Uh, he never wore a uniform. He was always in a, a suit. Um, so he was a plain clothesman. And everything he did was classified. Yeah. And that's been many, many years ago now. I'm I'm elderly now, so... I got you. Kind of, okay, so I was wondering, uh, do you have any uh, experience in uh, trying to get somebody's career records in that manner i do yeah and and you said he worked on a lot of classified stuff my grandfather did as well and for my father uh, had tracked down some information that he wrote that was once classified and actually got a report that he authored declassified my point with that is that there are not just military records but rather you can start poking around to see what he did and, and, you know, what he was pursuing right. and stuff like that. So the, the short answer is, yes, you can. The longer answer would probably be better served if I send you uh, some some ideas. I would I would want to ask you a couple questions, though, but I don't expect you to blast them out uh, here on the channel. But uh, I can uh, go ahead and help you through email or I can be more than happy to chat with you on the phone and uh, give you sure, a I, couple of of pointers. I can. So I can give you my email address. Sure. Let's not have you put it out over the air. What I'll do is I'll give you mine. Uh, and this is really, uh, really straight easy. If you just remember okay. John, John, which is my first name, John, J O H N at mm-hmm. the black And so that, that I, I can blast that out. I just didn't want you to put your uh, personal information out there. So John at the black Just go ahead and drop me an email. I'm happy to help you. Uh, that would be awesome. Um, I've chased the uh, UFO stuff all my life from being a little kid, knowing what my dad was supposedly doing. But mm-hmm. so, uh, and being born on the Roswell Air Force Base. Uh, so, was he part of Roswell so he, Army Airfield back in the day? 
Yeah, in 58 I was born there, and I have a military birth certificate from there. But, um, well, this is so what I'll, always pique, I'll, I'll always ask you some, my curiosity. Yeah, yeah, I'll ask you some of the years off the air, but just so you know and the audience knows, I track down a lot of the Roswell Army Airfield rosters and stuff like that, <clears> not <throat> only through the Roswell years, but years, years above. I have a huge collection of of air force history documents so yeah i'll yeah. have some ideas for you that we can pursue and hopefully maybe find his name somewhere and figure out what he did for you yeah i would love to to find out that information and uh, also see we were uh, stationed all over the united states uh, some nuclear facilities and, and whatnot and then he spent a lot of time uh overseas uh and in washington dc he spent quite a bit of time and in france and thailand germany he was all over the world wow probably was doing some pretty cool stuff so yeah make sure make sure you write me an email if you don't hear back from me there's a toll-free line uh not the one that's on screen that you called but uh rather uh on the website uh and then you can call and and leave a voicemail but make sure make sure you reach out I'm, i'm happy to help you I will. All righty. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I put a comment on screen from ZC. This caller is hitting home for me. I would love to FOIA my dad. So yes, you can absolutely. This goes to anybody, anywhere, anywhere. Uh, no matter your age, no matter where your location is, you could be living in France. It doesn't matter if you have reason to believe that there are files here, whether they be military, FBI files, whatever they might be. FOIA is open to you, and you can make some amazing discoveries so make sure you uh you know you 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 definitely do that and and uh pursue it and and i'm happy to help uh anybody i i have helped quite a few people over the years i'm happy to point you in the right direction so make sure you uh you do that let me uh go ahead and i'll pull this chat question here give me one second caller i'm going to put you on hold Hey, John, know anything about Pine Gap in Australia, the WikiLeaks email about DSP satellites? So DSP satellites are fascinating. I'm going to deal with the latter part first. Pine Gap, I mean, just the, the, the normal story, so I wouldn't have anything to, to really add on that. DSP satellites I pursued many, many years ago. It ties into somebody who used to work for Aerojet and, and um, uh, kind of a well-known name, if you know your UFO history, with Lee Graham. Uh, but long story short, had tried to pursue DSP satellites and their detection of UFOs in the atmosphere. So these were obviously classified pieces of technology that are there, they do exist, but their capabilities, their true capabilities are kind of classified. And uh, so it was very hard to get. So that that I pursued quite hard for a few years, but sadly they just wouldn't release anything. But I'm gonna, I'll write it down in, in a note for myself and uh, revisit it, just simply because it has been quite a few years since I've done that. But Uh, I saw that DSP satellite and I wanted to to make a quick comment on that. Uh, For those of you uh, who donated via chat, uh, Jetboy I saw, Daryl I saw, uh, and I'm sorry if I missed anybody, that all goes to support this channel. It all goes to uh, making this better. So even though I was full of technical blunders this time with the upgrade, uh, I assure you the upgrade was was definitely worth it. It's going to be awesome with interviews, much easier for the guest. And then once this is done, I'll probably export it from YouTube and then re-upload it with better audio. So that way you guys can listen to it in case, uh, you know, that audio really was awful in the beginning. So let me go to the phones again. Who's this? This is Dale J. Brown calling from North Dakota. Hey there. How are you? I'm good. Hi, John. Um, I've got a couple of questions for you. The first may not be pertaining to the last half hour or so, um, as I was on hold, didn't actually get to hear the program. But I wanted to ask you if you were aware of an individual named Bernard C. Peoples. Off the top of my head, that name does not sound familiar. Very few people are aware of of this case, but uh, in uh, 1947, just prior to the Roswell incident, there was a fellow named Bernard C. Peoples who uh, uh, got drunk and punched a police officer and subsequently was arrested and told the story of being picked up by a UFO that shot down a different UFO. And uh, he was then um, ridiculed in the community, so much so that he was brought into a radio station and uh, put on the air and there were calls into the radio station claiming to be government officials who actually shut the program down. There's a dual transcript of that that's available as well. It actually spells out quite nicely, fits in nicely with the uh, Roswell incident. I was just wondering if you're aware of that and if you've ever done any 
uh, Freedom of Information Act requests on Bernard C. Peoples. Mm -hmm. Secondly, uh, I wanted to get back more to matters at hand and today in regards to if you have ever heard of an organization with the acronym OPNAC. O-P-N-A-C. The uh, I, acronym my, for OPNAC is not listed with any government uh, agency as a, as a government agency itself. So what's but it stand for? But nonetheless, information can be found about the uh, OPNAC organization. Um, I did some research years ago and uh, was consulting with uh, Stanton Friedman, and uh, he didn't have the answers at that time either, but it apparently is a division that comes out of the operations of Naval Command. And um, I was able to find this organization uh, and its legitimacy through a cross-country run that was in Washington State where someone listed themselves as being involved with OPMAC, a parade in Bowling Green, Kentucky, where the parade marshal uh, was involved with OPMAC, and then in turn to the Minnesota ROTC program with the University of Minnesota, uh, where OPNAC was mentioned as, a, as a, a benefactor to the ROTC program there. And through that investigative effort, I found that uh, the government was recruiting personnel for the red team and blue team, uh, the UFO retrieval groups, alleged retrieval groups uh, outlined in the Majestic 12 uh, documents for, um, for recruitment into the government's uh, role. In, in investigating UFOs. So, again, OPNAC, O-P-N-A-C, is something that could be FOIA requested, and uh, it may not be real pertinent to events of the last 20 years. Uh, however, they may still be in operation, and uh, I think some information could be dug up that way, uh, just looking into OPNAC and uh, Bernard C. Peoples. Well, I appreciate that. I was taking notes here while you were chatting, and, uh, and I appreciate it because I, I'm not real familiar with either one. So uh, I don't know if you heard my email address. It's really easy, John, J-O-H-N, at theblackvault.com. Uh, if you can, drop me a line. I'd, I'd love to stay in touch with you, and, and I'll, I'll absolutely pursue the name and the, the acronym because, again, that doesn't sound familiar to me. But I appreciate the leads. Thank sure. you. Sure. We're, well, we're friends on Facebook, and we've met before in Vegas. I'm the former um, state director for the state of North Dakota's MUFON chapter. Gotcha. Um, Anyway, um, yeah, I, I want to give you kudos for the work you've been doing, and uh, I've been following your career for quite some time, and uh, I'm, I'm very proud of you as an American individual standing up for our American rights for uh, the information that we should be entitled to, and the work that you've done, and particularly your uh, Freedom of Information Act requests. Uh, remarkable work, uh, and I, on behalf of many, many other investigators, I'm sure, uh, thank you for that. Many, many ufologists are, are very happy you're doing the work that you're doing. Well, I appreciate that really, truly, and uh, thank you for saying that, and and thanks for listening, and and uh, you bet. Let, and get back. To, I'll let you get back to your other guests, and uh, I look forward to hearing this uh, broadcast on a, a later date. I appreciate it. Yeah, I'll be doing more of these, yeah. and uh, hopefully with less audio blunders. So thanks so much. Sure. Okay. Thanks. Bye now. All right, so I'm going to have to end this, but you can see on the screen, and I'm sorry for the callers that are still on, uh, and the reason I have to go is, uh, is, is uh, sadly, I wasn't going to do this for more than 20 minutes, uh, and I don't, even, I don't even see a clock here, but I think it's been much more than that. So I, I apologize. I do have to cut the stream, but uh, you can see on the screen there, I put my father who is probably, yep, you could see the icon there. He's in on Facebook. First time I've done the live streaming where it's broadcasting all over the place. So I put his, uh, his comment there. Hi, Dad. Thanks for listening. Uh, my second biggest fan, my mother, I think, is my first. But the reason why I put his uh, comment on there was it's a great question. He says, how far back can someone find military records if you know military ID serial numbers? And the answer to that is you can go as far back uh, to the beginning of the military. There are, however, cases where military files are no longer there. They, uh, the National Archives, I believe it was, I forget what year, but they actually had a major flood uh, where they lost quite a few different records. Uh, there have been fires over the years where military records have been destroyed. So with the exception of those chunks of, of time, 
uh, you can you can request back. Uh, it's just a matter of how far back then that defines where you go. So obviously, if you're looking for World War II records, generally you're going to be at the the military archives branch in the National Archives. Uh, something more recent, uh, sometimes you you can go like either directly to the Army or the Marine Corps or wherever. But a lot of times too, when you have that information, when you have the the essentially name, rank, and serial numbers and the year is key, they can tell you where to go. So you may file in the wrong place, but they're really good at helping. I mean, the FOIA gets a bad rap where, you know, people think, oh, they don't want to help you. In reality, they do. And so if you file in the wrong place, don't worry about it, especially with military records. They're generally right there uh, to, 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 to help you. So again, I do apologize, Matthew. Thank you for, uh, for that uh, comment. A great show. Uh, I, I will focus on that audio thing, which was really frustrating, but I think I've got it licked at this point. Uh, I will go back, I'll export this audio and then uh, pretty much fix it and re-upload another video so that way you guys don't have to bear through it uh, should anybody listen after the fact. So thank you all. I truly appreciate you taking this test ride with me and uh, essentially figuring out some of the tech issues with me. Uh, there's really kind of no better way than to just kind of jump right in. And Luis, who called from the Unidentified Celebrity Review, awesome dude, uh, had it right. You just kind of take it with stride, move forward. So even though I'm not new to the live streaming, I am to this software, hence the blunders. But hey, it'll only get better from here. Thank you guys all for listening, tuning in, and watching. This is John Greenwald Jr. signing off, and we'll see you next time.